Now, after this uh, fascinating and rather technical talk, and as we are all digesting our lunches, I thought we'd go for something slightly more light-hearted. Um, and by that I mean we're going to talk about the kind of things that philologists get to do on their off time. Um, so rather than an endoscopic view on Iranian sound changes, I thought I'd present you with the perspectives on the Iranians and Iranian language that other peoples have had. Now, I hope I won't disappoint all the classicists among you, uh, because part of uh, what I'm going to talk about is your bread and butter, namely Herodotus. Um, but I hope everyone else will be entertained and informed. Now, um, the most recent idea of what ancient Iran is like is, uh, in the popular image, might be something like this. This is an image of uh, King Xerxes from the movie 300, which deals with the invasion of the Achaemenids into um, Greece and ends with a bloody depiction of the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, we're not going to talk about him, or rather, not about this particular image, uh, because I personally, at any rate, prefer him in this way. Um, as a still rather larger-than-life uh, Achaemenid king. And what I would like to talk to you about are the various ways in which ancient or very fairly ancient civilizations uh, think about the Iranians and why they do it in the particular way that they do. So uh, the next 20 minutes or so will be a narr narrative attempt uh, and an anecdotal attempt at making that clear. Now, um, I've tried to focus on three peoples, uh, partly because two of them I know. Um, so the Greeks will be represented by our friend Herodotus, who has many fairly weird ideas about what the Iranians do. Then we'll have some Armenian uh, folklore data, and then some Chinese. And I apologize in advance for my horrible pronunciation of a couple of Chinese words. Um, also, if you ever ask me anything about the Chinese, my answer will be that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> Now, the thing that I would like you to think about as we go along is um, how accurate, how far off, how preposterous are these representations of the Iranians, and maybe why? Why do the various authors choose to portray them in such a fashion? And can we, as people who live a good two millennia, two and a half millennia later, account for this? Now, our first perspective, as I said, is going to be Herodotus, a uh, historian of fame uh, who lived in the middle of the 5th century BC and whose main claim to fame is his histories, his uh, attempt at a narrative uh, of the uh, Persian Wars between the Greeks and the Achaemenid Empire. And he delineates this uh, conflict in a great number of books with uh, historiographic um, panache, uh, but also with a great many digressions and diversions of a more ethnographic nature. And um, we'll look at a few of those. Um, now, the first one is the rise of King Darius, um, whom you've already heard about a couple of times today, certainly if you went to the cuneiform talk. Now, uh, Darius is a bit of an upstart, a homo novus, if you like. Um, he wasn't the son of a king. Um, does anyone know how Darius came to power? Hands. Yes, there are a few people who remember. Okay, the idea is that before Darius, uh, we had a king called Cambyses who, on a campaign to Egypt, uh, made a couple of mistakes. He angered the gods, and you, usually in ancient times, if you anger the gods, you die, um, which is what happened to Cambyses. Um, at the same time, just before that, he'd made another mistake. Um, he showed a form of uh, hubris in the form of jealousy of his brother. Uh, his brother, called Smerdus in the Greek, um, was better at drawing a particular bow. And because that's really bad, he had him killed. Because clearly that's what you do to your brother. Um, now, the unfortunate uh, coincidence is that back in uh, Persis, where he sent his brother to be killed, there was a chappie who apparently looked exactly like him. And so someone thought, oh, well, maybe we'll put him on the throne. And that's when we had two concurrent kings. Now, when Cambyses heard about this, he tried to get back to Persis and, um, you know, get rid of that king, as you would. Unfortunately, that's when fate struck and um, he died. 
now we have a usurper king on the throne. Um, a usurper king who, with a vast majority of the populace, uh, populace was quite um, popular, largely because he gave them tax relief and uh, stopped military conscription for a little while. Uh, only the ethnic Persians weren't too happy with him because he excluded them from that deal. And so a couple of Persian noblemen decided that uh, it was time to get rid of him. But first they needed to prove that this person was actually the imposter that he was, not the son, not the brother of Cambyses, but just a random person who looked like him. Um, they happened to know that he had one major difference to this brother of Cambyses. He didn't have ears. How they know that, no one tells us. Herodotus certainly does it. Uh, only the fact that the king, uh, the previous king, had his ears cut off for some grave misdeed. And this is what you've got here pictured in a ninth, uh, 19th century image. Uh, Faidume, the uh, I think sister of one of these noblemen, going to the bedchamber of this Smerdis, of this usurper king, and checking for his ears. Um, as she reports back to Otanius, the nobleman who has instigated this all, um, she reports, no, he doesn't have ears, and so they have good reason to get rid of him. Now enter Darius, randomly, literally randomly. He just comes, his father is a governor, and he thinks, um, I'll join in with these people. Um, they kill him after a couple of um, little skirmishes with the temple guards, sorry, the palace guards, and that's how he comes to power. In the middle, there's a quick debate about um, what form of government they should now take after they've deposed the king. Should it be democracy? Should it be oligarchy? Should it be monarchy? Uh, Darius wins the debate. Darius wins the kingship by cheating with his horse in a weird contest about you can, which you can ask later. Um, it has to do with um, horses' virility. Um, and so Darius is king. It's a fairly weird story, isn't it? A little complex, um, too many people doing too many things at the same time, knowing things that they couldn't possibly have known. Um, and yet, um, it isn't the only account of this story. Um, we actually find a, well, if not a verification, then a very similar account in the inscription of Darius at Behistun. He leaves out a great amount of the details um, because he has a slightly different agenda. Um, and so instead of this complex story that I've just related to you, we read this. There was once a man, uh, a mage called Gamata. He rose up, he lied to the people saying, I'm Bardia, so it's the Persian form of the name Smerdis, uh, the brother of the Cambyses, the king. And so the people rose up with him and they enjoyed him being king. Um, but some people feared him greatly. Uh, no one dared say anything about the suspicions that they had that he might only be a usurper. Um, and so I, with a few men, slew this Gaumata, and then by the grace of Ahura Mazda, I became king. Um, so this is a first instance where we see Herodotus, our slightly eccentric Greek historian, as we'll see in just a moment, being confirmed in his curious accounts of Persian history by the Persians, the Achaemenids themselves. Um, now, why would the Greeks paint a slightly less heroic image of Darius in him coming in at the last moment? Well, because very, very, very broadly speaking, the Greeks didn't like the Persians, um, which, given that they invaded their country and caused a lot of death, is probably not uh, too problematic for us. Um, now, let's move on just a tiny bit in history and go um, one generation further. This is just an image that you may have seen a couple of times today already of the inscription of Darius at Behistun, where all this is mentioned, apart from many other things. Um, and the best part is, if you look very closely, you can actually see the usurper Gaumata, or Smerdis, or Bardia, under his feet, by which he says, <laughs> look what I've done. Um, now, we move on one generation to who came after Darius, anyone? Xerxes, Xerxes exactly, Kshayarsha. Um, and he, again, was plagued by this great Greek problem of hubris. He wasn't too um, kind 
to the gods or to one of the personification of the instances of the god, namely the sea. And when he was trying to bridge the Hellespont um, to get to Greece, get his army to Greece, and build a pontoon bridge, he got a little angry when the, a big storm got rid of that pontoon bridge. And I mean, when you and I get angry, we might cry out in anger or pain or uh, frustration, or we might write an angry letter to the editor, but we certainly don't do what Xerxes did, namely go to the Hellespont and have it fetted, have it lashed, and potentially have it branded. Um, especially branding the sea seems like a very weird idea to me. Um, now, you might think that this is an invention of Herodotus to show how completely demented Xerxes already was. And there's a couple of other instances where he has weird dreams um, that hint at very similar things. Um, however, this is not the only account that we have of him um, doing something quite as foolish as this. There's also Aeschylus, who in his Persians uh, writes very similar things. And again, you've got a nice 19th century depiction of Xerxes here. So where he, the ghost of his father Darius now declaims, uh, as he hears about what, per, what Xerxes has done, a fountain of misfortune has now, I think, been discovered for all I love. A son of mine it was who in his ignorance brought these things to pass through youthful recklessness, for he conceived the hope that he could by shackles, as if it were a slave, restrain the current of the sacred Hellespont. And thus, you know, effectively act against the gods, against Poseidon. Now, we have no direct proof that Xerxes did this, um, because if he did, he probably wouldn't have blagged about it himself. Um, but there is an interesting parallel of um, someone using a fetter or a goad um, against another element in Iranian history. Um, if you go back to the Videvdad, there is a, an instance where Yima, the, one of the sort of famous early kings of the Iranians, um, takes a goad and pushes it into the earth three times, or in three separate instances, telling the earth to expand and to grow and to make place for his people. Um, what that suggests? Very little, I think. I mean, it is possibly an image that may have survived throughout the ages. But at the very least, we get this same idea of a transgression of a king against a natural force um, that has led to it being recorded in history. Now, so far we've looked at royals and royals only, um, but that would be just a tad boring. So I thought we'd have a look at one, at least one other instance um, of Herodotus telling us something slightly curious. And um, since this is an Indo-Iranian and not just an Iranian philology, I thought we'd go to India as well. And there we read about um, these Indians um, who figure out that uh, there are, in the sandy desert, ants. Not as big as dogs, but bigger than foxes. I beg you to imagine that. <laughs> um, and uh, which have been caught there, and that these ants live underground, and they, uh, which is the best part, they dig up gold. Wouldn't we all like to have that kind of ant farm? Now, um, you might say, okay, he's completely off his rocker. This doesn't work, this can't possibly be. Uh, insects just don't grow to that size, or so we hope. Um, now, the best part is that in the mid-90s, uh, a French uh, ethnologist uh, did a study in what is northern Pakistan and suggested that this animal might actually exist, just that Herodotus was slightly wrong in the species, and that what we are actually dealing with is um, this. <laughs> so, I think we can all agree on the fact that this is not an ant. <laughs> it is indeed a marmot, the Himalayan marmot, which is fantastically actually known to carry with it or around it gold dust from the very uh, rich earth of northern Pakistan. Um, now, one suggestion that has been made that I haven't been able to verify is that this is just an error of translation. Herodotus clearly didn't, well, we know, didn't travel as far as Pakistan, if he traveled at all. Um, and that what we are dealing with is uh, someone mistranslating marmot, which someone suggested might be, uh, in Persian, a mountain ant. 
and um, so that this very furry large mountainous ant uh, made its way into Herodotus' books by accident. Um, if you want to look at, into Herodotus any further, I can only recommend it. There's also delightful stories about the thickness of skulls, uh, where the Persians are said to have much thinner skulls because they wear hats, whilst the Egyptians have thick skulls because they shave their heads. Um, not an experiment that I'd care to repeat, but he uh, experiences this on a battlefield. Now, we move on. We've so far seen a slightly curious image of the Persians as hubristic, generally slightly weird, um, and um, well, we've also seen that Herodotus might just be a tad loopy. Um, we move on both in terms of cultures, we go further to the east, to Armenia, and we move on in time. We go to the time of the Parthians and the Sasanians, so uh, for our purposes, let's say the fourth and, sorry, yes, fourth and fifth century uh, common era. Um, and we read about the conversion of King Tirdat III, King Tiridates, um, who uh, is one of the great Armenian names and heroes, um, not necessarily for what he did, but maybe rather for what he didn't do. Um, the story begins by uh, Tirdat falling in love with a Roman uh, noble virgin. And if you do that, then clearly you have to convince her by either words or force uh, to marry you or to, in other ways, have partic particular kinds of relations with you. Um, in the case of uh, Khripsime, which is the name of that delightful young uh, lady, um, his attempts uh, did not succeed. She fights him off with superhuman strength. And, of course, the only result uh, that that can yield is her being killed. And not only her, but also her friend Gayane and uh, more than 30 other virgins. He also imprisoned a Christian missionary called Gregory, um, who later on becomes known as Gregory the Illuminator. And as he does that, um, he angers the God, the Christian God. Um, and so, as he set out, sets out to hunt, he turns into a pig, as you do. Um, so, when the king was about to leave the city, suddenly punishment from the Lord befell him, and he turned into the likeness of wild pigs and dwelt among them. There's a couple of interesting things about this. So first of all, we need to note that the Armenians at this point in time were ruled by an Iranian dynasty, by the Arsacid Parthians. Um, this is the, uh, the junior branch of the uh, Parthians, the one that rules Armenia, uh, versus the ones that actually created and ruled the Parthian Empire up till about uh, 224 AD. Um, and so what we have to deal with is a sort of conflict between Armenians, national Armenians, and the um, Parthian ruling class, which over time sort of Armenianize themselves in one way or another. So as you might guess, the perspective on the Iranians from the Armenian point of view is slightly more split. They don't think they're all bad, just most of them. Um, so King Terdat, this Parthian ruler uh, of Armenia, gets turned into a boar, and of course the only reprieve he gets off this punishment is by converting to Christianity uh, at the hands of the person that he put into a chorvirap, a deep hole filled with snakes, which miraculously this holy man survived um, by a woman in trance who brings him <coughs> bread every day for seven years. It's a very complicated and slightly weird story, as all stories of conversion are, but it also yields wonderful Baroque images. Like this one, which is the baptism of King Tadat, this Parthian ruler who becomes the first Christian ruler of Armenia in about 300 um, BC. Sorry, no, not C, BC. <laughs> that would be weird. Uh, common era. Um, I don't know how clear it is in the back of the room, but please note that he still has a boar's head and a rather, a rather, cu a rather cute boar at that. Um, as you may know, if you know your literature, this, sort of, this transformation of uh, people into animals as punishment is not uncommon. We've had that in Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who turns into a boar as well. We get it in Apuleius, where someone turns into a donkey. Um, all quite common. Um, do we take this at face value? I haven't seen it happen recently. Um, but we don't know what happened in ancient times, of course, and what kind of drugs they took. Um, but again, we get this split image 
of the Iranians being the perpetrators against Christianity and then equally being the ones who introduce, who adopt Christianity and thus turn into the good guys. Now, and this is where it becomes particularly interesting. We need to separate the Iranians into families. Um, the Parthians, it turns out, are quite all right. Once they've converted, they're, they're the good guys. The Armenians like them, they rule them. If you read Armenian, um, you had better also learn some Iranian languages because the vocabulary is entirely full of it. Um, but there's also the other guys, uh, the Middle Persians, the Sasanians, and uh, they are not so great, largely because they keep on waging war with the kingdom of Armenia and pretty much everyone else around as well. Um, and so we get this delightful uh, passage from the epic histories attributed to Faustus, um, where we get a conflict between a uh, Parthian king of Armenia and the Sasanian king of kings, Shabur. Um, and we also get some nice, probably not particularly Zoroastrian, but just generally folkloristic magic. So um, Shabur sends out two, on the advice of his um, magi, sends out two emissaries to Armenia to bring some soil back to him, Armenian soil. And he lays them out in his stately tent. And as the king, Arshak, comes to him, they are going to have a diplomatic dispute. Yeah, they're going to talk about why Arshak is going to be is so problematic, why he keeps on making trouble and isn't a good vassal. Um, and the idea is that in this tent, magic will be done, and the Armenian king will speak his true mind when he stands on Armenian soil, but might still you know, please and uh, smear honey around the mouth of the uh, Persian king when he is on Persian soil. Um, and so it says, um, you should speak with a rough man, uh, now should he speak with a rough manner while walking over Armenian soil, be advised that as soon as he reaches Armenia, he will address you with the same voice, will renew the same fight, war and hostility with you. The history of the third, fourth, even fifth century between the Armenians and the Sasanians is a delightful mixture of uh, being best friends and waging war the next day. Um, so this is a sort of attempt at finding out what's going to happen next. His father, uh, so Ashak's father, managed to get a reasonably stable peace on. Um, Ashak himself did not do that. And after this event where sort of Shabur takes him by the hand and leads him around the tent and he switches back between, oh, your grace and F off, um, bad things happen to Arshak, as you can imagine. He is taken to uh, a fortress, the Fortress of Oblivion, um, and there is presented with one of his best friends stuffed with hay after having been flayed and just generally dies a very unhappy death. The curious part is that this Fortress of Oblivion is mentioned not only in the Armenian text but also in other Manichaean texts later. Um, and generally when you take someone to the fortress of oblivion, they don't get out. Except in the Armenian versions where a couple of people do, because otherwise it would be bad storytelling. Now, the Armenians, as you see, have a slightly more split perspective on the Iranians, um, partly because they have a personal stake in one of them, uh, in the Parthians. Um, the Parthian rulership of Armenia is quite long. Effectively, the Armenians have been ruled by Iranian people for about a thousand years till about 428 when um, they decide that they can just have a Sasanian governor and then things get very, very complicated. So now we've had a Greek perspective on the Iranians, generally meh, a Armenian perspective which is slightly more balanced depending on where you come from and who you are. Um, and now we turn even further east to our friends, the Chinese. Now they, in their two historiographic books, and this is where I come to my horrible pronunciations, uh, so in the Shi Zhe, um, and later on in the Han Huan Shu, um, give us a far more mellow and direct, very objective account of what happens in uh, Parthia, mainly. And they tell us it's a large country. It is a country with many great cities. It is a country with culture, with a culture and customs not unlike our own. They seem to be slightly befuddled by the idea that they use coins with the images of emperors on them, which change on a regular basis. Um, but the other, and that it takes a long, long time to get over certain seas, 
because of winds and weather conditions. Um, but the most curious facts that they seem to come up with is uh, large birds. They are mentioned multiple times. So in these parts, namely in Parthia, live birds which lay eggs as large as saucepans. Do we have any ornithologists in the room? Can you think of a bird that has very large eggs? Ostriches. Where do ostriches live? Not in Parthia. <laughs> so that leaves two conclusions, uh, multiple conclusions. Either we have a cryptid or a, you know, as yet undiscovered archaeological and ancient bird that the Chinese and the Parthians knew about but didn't tell us, or um, they were exaggerating, and what we're dealing with is a sli slightly less than saucepan-sized egg, so maybe the egg of a goose or a, uh, a peacock. But then again, the Chinese would have known about those. They're not sort of that endemic. Um, or the Parthians have imported ostriches, probably not for their flesh, possibly for riding uh, or just general displaying as status symbols. Uh, either which way, this is one of those weird facts that we get. Um, but it is absolutely not a value judgment. We don't get any of those in the Chinese data, and that is worth noting. Um, secondly, we note a few more, other, a few more things that from uh, Da Yuan, uh, a great Bactrian kingdom to Anhi, uh, sorry, Anhi, Parthia in the West, they speak many different languages. We know about that. We know about Middle Persian. We know about Bactrian, Sogdian, Parthian, and plenty others. And now they say, and in spite of this, their customs are quite similar and their language is mutually intelligible. Now, um, most of us don't have a problem in assuming that for Parthian and Middle Persian, the differences between those languages are not so great as to make them completely unintelligible and intelligible to one another. Um, they have fairly similar structures, so that's plausible. Between all the other Middle Iranian languages and that group, however, it would be a little more surprising. So um, here the question is, whom did the Chinese actually meet? Um, the accounts also tell us that they were met by a very large retinue of the Parthian emperors, or Parthian kings, uh, 20,000 men strong, and were led from the borders to the capitals, and they're entertained splendid splendidly. Um, and the same happened when they went back. So maybe they just didn't encounter too many different language speakers. Um, or we don't know enough about our Middle Iranian languages as yet. Um, they are also great at commerce, and they will argue even about a ha halfpenny. Um, does anyone have an idea whether that is still the case in modern Iran? If I remember correctly, that bartering is one of the great customs in that country. Maybe that is one of the uh, very few direct um, links between the ancient and the, the modern. But, uh, and this last point I have only put in because my wife told me to, uh, they hold their women in high esteem and only act if a woman has approved it. Um, how much credence we should uh, give that particular statement, I don't know. Uh, but it certainly shows you that this perspective, this Chinese perspective um, on the Iranians is very much more um, well, it's, it's lacking vitriol, and it's lacking any sort of objectional, uh, object, yes, objectional material. Now, uh, what do we conclude from all this? Um, mainly that if you have a personal stake in a country or the, in a people, you will have a very personal attitude towards them. If they kill your family, if they kill people of your nation, you probably will have a slightly less favorable attitude towards them than otherwise. Um, and as we've seen from uh, our Marmot friends, um, even the weirdest stories might just have a kernel of truth. Um, however, hyperbolically, they may have been put in ancient historiography. Um, so however weird our historiography might be, be it Greek, be it Armenian, be it Chinese, um, it still contains pieces of information that can be valuable for historians or for ethnogra ethnographers. Uh, and at the very least, as I hope I've shown, it can be relatively entertaining. And that's where I leave you. Thank you. <laughs>